This is a presentation of the University of Wisconsin Parkside. Well, again, good evening and welcome to the University of Wisconsin Parkside. I am Debbie Ford and I have the honor of serving as the chancellor for this wonderful university. And it is my honor to be able to welcome you tonight to our celebration of the Big Read. So the Big Read is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts and it is in partnerships with Arts Midwest. And our team um, here at UW Parkside under the leadership of our amazing uh, director of our library, Joe Cates, applied for a grant through the National Endowment for the Arts and so that is part of what is making tonight possible. The Big Read is designed to revitalize the role of literature in American culture and to encourage people to read for pleasure and enrichment. This is Parkside's first Big Read Award and we are proud to share it with our Racine and Kenosha communities. And let me tell you, the communities and you have come out to show your support about the importance of literacy and support for this Big Read. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I also want to thank our many community partners, but tonight is possible because of the Kenosha Public Library Foundation. They are sponsoring and have funded our keynote celebration of Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 with our very special guest, Mr. Sam Weller. So welcome and we're glad you could be here. <clears throat> But events like this do not happen easily or without a lot of planning. And so I would like for you, our community partners, to join me in thanking our library and our Big Read team. So let me see if I got every, uh, hopefully if I have everybody on my list here. The Big Read team, we have um, Ann Rasmussen and Melissa Olson have served as our co-chairs. We also have Paige Mano and Anna Static and they wrote the grant proposal that made this event possible. Heather Spencer, Jan Miko, and Laura Mason. And Laura is from Creative Services and created the flyers, graphics, and banners. And then of course, Joe Cates, the director of our library. So all of these folks need to stand up because it's all their leadership. <clears throat> I've been saying for several weeks, and those of you who have visited Wiley Hall, you really can see that our library is truly on fire. And uh, so our director of libraries has a very special, special shawl tonight to show her being on fire. And I wore a shirt that looks like we're on fire um, in honor of this great occasion. But I want to share with you something from our past um, and how our past comes together with what we're doing tonight. Um, our very first chancellor, Irv Wiley, passed away in 1974, and two years later, Wiley Hall was dedicated. And UW president at the time, Fred Harrington, wrote a letter about Chancellor Wiley and Wiley Hall, which is also our library. And we believe that Wiley was very much in line with Ray B Bradbury's worldview. And this is what President Herring Harrington had to say about our first chancellor. He, Wiley, took education seriously. He saw value in books and scholarship. He believed in study, basic learning, and the standard disciplines. But he did not see the world of books as a retreat from reality. Rather, he considered it a proper preparation for a meaningful life. And so just as our first chancellor, just as the founders of this university saw the importance of books and literacy and knowledge, we see that today. And that is evident from the group here tonight. It is so wonderful to see so many friends of the university, um, graduate students and future students over here in uh, about the third row. I see some future Parkside students. Um, it is so wonderful that you have come out to be a part of the UW Parkside Big Read. And this is really all about the community. So before you leave tonight, I have my 10 second spot, um, announcement. Take a look at all the events happening. This is just the beginning. And all of this is possible, again, from the leadership and the commitment 
to events like this at UW Parkside. But this would not be possible this evening without the leadership of our outstanding and truly real amazing library director, and that is Joe Cates. So please join me in welcoming Joe Cates as she continues our program. So yeah, nobody reads books anymore, right? <laughs> um, Chancellor Ford, Provost Fred Ebard, I want to thank you for your support of this singular Big Read experience. Fred, where are you? Thank you. Um, Fred, uh, due to the popularity of Big Read, we had to put in an emergency order of Fahrenheit 451 books. Um, I have an invoice. <laughs> for you. <laughs> um, I have witnesses. <laughs> I'm really not kidding. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm glad, um, Debbie, you took uh, a moment to recognize the Big Read team. We really do appreciate that. We also want to thank the uh, university relations staff, John Cherchapsky, John Milkey, and Kim Sakis, um, all part of a, uh, of a big team that that culminated in, in this. Wow. Fahrenheit 451 was the clear choice for Parkside's Big Read. With its dystopian themes and exploration of censorship, this book obviously speaks loudly to our community. And so does Ray Bradbury, a lifelong lover and supporter of books and libraries and librarians and the freedom to read. Sam Weller is an old friend, so I sometimes forget that he's a pretty big deal. <laughs> Sam is the associate chair of the creative writing department at Columbia College Chicago. He also is the authorized biographer of Ray Bradbury. His book, The Bradbury Chronicles, was an LA Times bestseller and winner of the Society of Midland Authors Award for Best Biography. The companion book, Listen to the Echoes, was published in 2010. Sam co-edited the short fiction anthology Shadow Show, All New Stories in Celebration of Ray Bradbury, which won the Bram Stoker Award for Superior Achievement in an Anthology. And his fourth Bradbury-related book, Ray Bradbury, The Last Interview, will be published in December. You may have read his essays in the Paris Review or the Huffington Post, the Chicago Tribune, and dozens of other newspapers and journals. You may have heard him speak on NPR's All Things Considered. But tonight, he's all ours. We now have the wonderful opportunity to hear from the person who knew Ray Bradbury best, someone who has clearly documented Bradbury's brilliance, but can also share stories of Bradbury's uncertainties and eccentricities and all those other things that made him so very human. Thank you so much for being here. I think it's going to be a real good night. Thank you. Wow. Good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us. As long as um, I have the, the pulpit here, let's do a community selfie. <laughs> Raise your hands if you're sure, right? All right. Thank you for coming out. I have done hundreds of events around the world, um, and I've never seen an event like this before. I've never seen this level of community engagement. I've never seen this level of organization. Uh, I've never seen this level of creativity, and it's a testament to uh, the communities of Kenosha and Racine, uh, and certainly UW Parkside. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, absolutely stunned at, at uh, the schedule of events you've all lined up, and you should all be very proud. Thank you to Chancellor Ford for her lovely introduction tonight uh, and for your commitment to learning, knowledge, and to libraries. Uh, thank you uh, to our other distinguished guests here this evening, including Mayor Bosman, and to all of you here tonight for supporting books, reading, literacy, understanding and education. And of course, thank you to my dear friend, Joe Cates. I don't know where she disappeared to, probably the bar, I hope. 
um, <coughs> who is certainly the most visionary and creative librarian I've ever known, and I've known a good many. There's, there's uh, a few more I know tonight in the room, and, and uh, it's just an honor to be, be together with all of you. <coughs> As an educator and as a, as a father of three, I have learned that instilling a sense of curiosity in my students and in my children is paramount. For a curious person becomes a lifelong learner. A lifelong learner, of course, enriches our world through critical thought, opinion, ideas, and in turn goes on to educate others. In the last 14 years, I've traveled the world over as Ray Bradbury's authorized biographer. Just a week ago, I was in the maritime provinces of Canada spreading the Bradbury word. And I can tell you that not every municipality or community or institution of higher education for that matter values the library as a destination for intellectual freedom. Not everyone understands the vital role that universities and libraries and books play in our society. As Ray Bradbury once told me, an educated and well-read society is central to the concept of democracy. In order to be an informed voter, of course, he said, in order to stand up and vote intelligently, one must be informed. The society depicted in his novel Fahrenheit 451 is anything but informed. And as a result, they are powerless. Our public libraries and university libraries have been under fire in these recent times of budgetary scrutiny. Libraries are often looked at by those who lack curiosity as non-essential services. The world envisioned by Bradbury in Fahrenheit 451 tells us otherwise. Bradbury's 1953 novel depicts a world no longer interested in critical thought, a society dependent on multimedia and technology, a dystopia that no longer values books and reading, and in many ways it's frightening how close we have come to the world inhabited by Guy Montag and Clarice McClellan. Our living room walls are decked out with massive flat panel television screens. When we aren't staring at a TV, we are looking at smartphones, tablets. <laughs> Hypocrite, I know. Our relationships often come through 140 character tweets and the friends we follow on Facebook, rather than the friends we sit down with and have a long conversation. Our ears are crammed with seashell radio earbuds, tuning out everything else in the process. Events like tonight's event and the, the array of amazing events to follow, put together by this incredible uh, and visionary and creative staff, the events here at Parkside and throughout Kenosha and Racine bring us all together. He said, you know, I've thought about this idea you presented about biography, and I've changed my mind. He was a huge believer in following our passions, and I spoke about this today uh, to a class here at the university, a marvelous group of students. Um, and his mantra, one of his life mantras was, do what you love and love what you do. And it's a simple philosophy, but he said, you know, I, I always wrote stories because I love them. I, I wrote for movies because I loved movies. I wrote for comic books because I loved comic books. And he said, you know, I wrote about the things I, I loved as a child books and libra libraries and saving them in Fahrenheit 451 and, and many other topics. Uh, he always went back to his great passions and he said, you are a very passionate person for my life story and I think that's the person who should write it. And so uh, that was a remarkable day as you can imagine and, and so began the journey uh, towards this book which came out in 2005. And what I endeavored to prove with this book on him uh, were sort of a, a dual theses, if you will. I wanted to show one, not just to articulate the biography of the man, but I wanted to articulate the biography of the man's imagination. That was very important to me. How does a young man who uh, is raised in a very uh, low-income household, his father was a, a lineman for the local power company, was unemployed constantly through the 20s and then into the Great Depression, how does an, an imagination that impacts the entire world, how does a man who never had the, the, the financial resources to go to a UW Parkside and seek a higher education, how does that imagination happen? And so I wanted to survey and chart that in the process of writing his life. Um, and I was very pleased when the book came out that one of the reviews said this is a blueprint for would-be parents on how to raise an, an imaginative child. Follow the prescription that Bradbury 
followed, and you too can have an imaginative child or grandchild or niece or nephew. So in that regard, I feel the book succeeded. The other thing I wanted to illustrate with the book was just how important this man is to the finest of 20th century culture. I would argue passionately that I don't think there's a writer in the 20th century who did more to impact popular culture than this man. Now that sounds like a rather hyperbolic statement, but if you'll, if you'll uh, forgive me for a moment, I will endeavor to prove it to you. Not only did he write the ninth best-selling classic in, in America, Fahrenheit 451, which rests on an esteemed list that includes Catcher in the Rye, To Kill a Mockingbird, The Great Gatsby, 1984. I mean, these are the great works of global literature, and Bradbury's book sits amongst them. Not only did he write that, but of course he wrote many other seminal works of literature, including The Martian Chronicles, The Illustrated Man, The Golden Apples of the Sun, Dandelion Wine, The Halloween Tree, Something Wicked This Way Comes, and on and on and on. So his literary accomplishments are many and storied. It was his dream as a young child growing up in Waukegan to one day have a book on a shelf resting near his heroes, L. Frank Baum on one end and H.G. Wells on the other, uh, and perhaps Jules Verne resting near him. And he did that. He achieved that. But along the way, his book also sits with Fitzgerald and Harper Lee and J.D. Salinger and George Orwell. It's a remarkable story. So along with the literary achievements and his ascension into the pantheon of great literature, he also wrote widely for movies and cinema. Beginning in 1956, he wrote the screenplay to Moby Dick for John Huston. And Bradbury loved to tell that story when he was alive. He passed away, incidentally, June 5th, 2012. But he loved to tell the story. The very week he finished Fahrenheit 451, August 1953, uh, John Huston, the great American film maverick, called him. Bradbury had been sending his books to the director saying, if you love me half as much as I love you, you'll let me write a screenplay for you. <laughs> never mind the fact that Ray Bradbury had never written a screenplay. But on August 17th, 1953, Bradbury uh, was at a bookstore of all things and came home and his wife said, John Huston called you. And Bradbury called Huston back. He was at the Beverly Hills Hotel and Houston invited him over and they had martinis in the suite. And he said, what are you doing, Ray, the next year or so? And he said, not much, Mr. Houston, not much. And he said, how would you like to come to Ireland with me and help me kill the white whale? <clears throat> now Bradbury panicked because he said, you know, Mr. Houston, I've never been able to read that damn book. <laughs> and Houston retorted quickly and said, well, go home tonight, read Moby Dick and call me in the morning. <clears throat> and so Bradbury attempted to do just that. And now those of us in the room who have endeavored to read the Melville classic know that that's an impossible feat. Um, he went home and walked in his house and told his wife, pray for me. <laughs> and she said, now what? And he said, I have to read a book tonight and do a book report by morning. <laughs> and he sat down on the sofa and started to read Herman Melville's Moby Dick and fell in love with the language and the metaphor and the biblical allegory and the Shakespearean overtones. He just fell in love with it. Certainly didn't read the whole book, disappointing Houston, uh, but agreed nonetheless the next day to call Houston and say, I'm in, I will write the screenplay to Moby Dick. Along with that, th that film, he also adapted his own books to the silver screen uh, with limited uh, success over the years, but some of them are very good, including the Truffaut classic, uh, adaptation and uh, also the Something Wicked This Way Comes from 1983. He worked widely in television. He wrote three episodes of The Twilight Zone and helped Rod Serling develop the program. He, he wrote eight episodes uh, for Alfred Hitchcock for his Hitchcock's television program, Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Bradbury had his own television program, of course, in the mid 80s and early 90s called the Ray Bradbury Theater, which ran on HBO long before HBO was sort of the benchmark for dramatic creative television that it is today. Uh, Bradbury served as executive producer and wrote all 65 episodes. He won 12 Cable Ace Awards in the process. Um, outside of his television work, he worked very successfully during the golden era of radio, penning scripts for dramatic uh, radio serials, adapting many of his short stories very beautifully and successfully to the radio. Uh, he's adapted his works to comic books over the years. 
Uh, he's worked extensively in theater. He had his own theater company, uh, produced plays for decades in Los Angeles. He produced plays in New York and in London. Um, he's designed architectural plans. He designed a shopping plaza in San Diego. He designed a shopping plaza in Glendale, California. He designed a shopping plaza in Tokyo. He designed Spaceship Earth at Epcot Center. The geodesic dome that we all know is the iconic symbol of, of Epcot is based on a Bradbury concept. He worked with the Disney company, uh, started working with Walt Disney, in fact, in 1964. Uh, they had a, started a friendship and continued on after Disney's passing and was there at Epcot upon its opening in 1982. His cultural contributions are so massive that there's a crater on the moon named for Ray Bradbury. Now, I can't, I don't know how many other authors can claim, uh, you know, lunar accolades, but Mr. Bradbury can. There's an asteroid named for Bradbury. In fact, on what would have been his 92nd birthday when the Curiosity rover had landed on the surface of Mars and inched along taking its first movements on the Martian surface, the scientists at NASA and Jet Propulsion Laboratories named that region Bradbury Landing on Bradbury's birthday for Ray Bradbury. Not bad for a little boy who used to rest out on the dew-covered lawn of his grandparents' home at 619 West Washington in Waukegan, Illinois, and stare up at the stars. <clears throat> so that's the story that I hope to uh, illustrate in my first book. I didn't realize that this first book would morph into more books. It started as a magazine story and turned into a biography, and then in 2010, a publisher contacted me and asked how much of my uh, interview transcripts did I use in the first book, and the truth was probably only 10%. And they said, would you like to use some of the others in, in uh, just direct transcribed conversations between the two of you? This book came out in 2010, and I'm very proud of it. It's a lot of pictures of, of uh, Bradbury's life in there over the years, photographs throughout his house, uh, when he was 90 and we were working on the book. Um, but it's also organized thematically. So there's a chapter on Hollywood. There's a chapter on politics. There's a chapter on faith. Lots of people are curious about Bradbury's spiritual leanings. Uh, a, polit uh, a chapter on creativity and his approach to writing. Uh, and so this book came out in 2012 or 2010. Uh, in 2012, uh, Joe Cates mentioned this anthology, which again was unexpected, but uh, I put this together with a colleague, um, Mort Castle, who's nine times been nominated for the Bram Stoker Award and has been nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. And he said, why not do a tribute anthology in honor of Ray Bradbury, going to all the great writers in the world who have said over the years, Bradbury influenced me. And so we very quickly started to contact these writers. Interestingly enough, I was at a park one day with my children and I started to tweet uh, Margaret Atwood and Neil Gaiman and Neil Gaiman has won the Newbery Award and is just a rock star when it comes to literature. And I just sent them messages on Twitter and within 10 minutes they had both responded and said, count me in, I'd love to contribute a new story. That's the beauty of this modern society for all uh, it, its drawbacks and, and negatives. Um, and of, of course about technology creeping into our lives, certainly it affords us many great uh, positives as well. One of them was a, a, the quick ability to assemble this book. This book was given the Bram Stoker Award last year, um, and I'm quite proud of it, and it includes 26 all new stories, uh, really celebrating the breadth and wonder of the Bradbury canon, from stories set in deep space, to stories set in dystopic futures, to stories set in small town America, and everything in between. <coughs> Tonight we're gathered here, of course, to talk about what is largely considered his magnum opus, his, his classic, uh, published October 1953 in a print run of just 5,000 copies. Fahrenheit 451 today sells more copies than it, it ever before. It sells more copies than it has in its entire print run history. Uh, and I think that's a testament to its timeless quality, its connection to modern society, its connection to uh, the millennial generation, and, and many other factors. Um, <clears throat> the book uh, has had its own censorship history, of course. Um, in the late 1960s, a high school edition of Fahrenheit 451 uh, was published, and a few words that at the time were deemed questionable, words you would hear on primetime television without fail today, uh, were excised from the book unbeknownst to Mr. Bradbury. 
really great irony if you think about it. This book on censorship is censored. <coughs> sort of this incredible meta-censorship going on. Um, and he was actually quite enraged about it and demanded that the high school edition be returned to its original state. Bradbury was a fierce advocate for speech, uh, the First Amendment, um, and the importance of, of, of reading and not uh, censoring, particularly when it, the author is not aware of the censorship. Um, <clears throat> the story of the writing of Fahrenheit 451, I think, is one of the most magnificent making of a book stories ever told. Um, if you think about it, and if you've read the foreword or the introduction to Fahrenheit 451 by Mr. Bradbury, he talks about how he wrote the book. But if you'll bear with me for a minute, I'd like to share with you sort of the origins behind the novel, how the novel came to existence, what were the cultural influences that led to the writing of this book, and then ultimately how he wrote the book itself. Fahrenheit 451 really is a celebration of Bradbury's love of, of reading, of literature, and libraries. It begins when uh, he's just a child growing up in Waukegan, and he would go to the old Carnegie Library on Sheridan Road uh, in, in Waukegan overlooking the lake, and go to the old Carnegie, and I know we have a Carnegie right here in downtown uh, Kenosha. And he would go every Monday and Wednesday and pile his arms up with books uh, that delighted him. Again, his family had no money, so there was little money to buy anything, and libraries provided this incredible opportunity to educate and explore and imagine. And he recalled fondly running home uh, with his arms loaded with books on autumn nights like this and leaves rushing behind him and going through the door and the door slamming behind him and going in his room and climbing under the covers and staying up late as all kids do with the flashlight under the covers and reading books thanks to the services provided by the local public library. So he had fallen in love with the library and fallen in love with books and fallen in love with librarians. In 1934, he traveled, his family, his father was out of work, and he moved to Hollywood. Bradbury was also equally influenced by cinema, loved film. Uh, first movie he saw was The Hunchback of Notre Dame, starring Lon Chaney, and he instantly connected to the outcast, the maligned outcast character, and the, fan, and the element of the fantastic, the creature. And so his, his, his attraction to fantasy was developing because of films like that. And his, he had an aunt who was nine years older than him, his aunt Neva, who was a, an artist, a painter, a dressmaker. She sewed dresses at the 1933 Century of Progress World's Fair in New York, in Chicago. Um, she went to the Art Institute for school in Chicago, and she gave him books by L. Frank Baum, the Oz book. She gave him Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. She gave him Tales of Mystery and Imagination by Edgar Allan Poe, introduced Bradbury to the fantastic when he was a young child, and he, he absorbed those books and fell in love with those books. Um, and so he's developing this love of literature and reading and a love of cinema, and when he moved to L.A. when he was 13 years old, the first thing he did was strap a pair of old steel roller skates on the bottom of his shoes and roller skated two miles to the gates of Paramount Studios, hoping, hoping, and hoping to meet some of the stars of, of the golden era of cinema. And he was out there for 10 minutes, and W.C. Fields walks out. And there's 13-year-old bespectacled Ray Bradbury standing there with his autograph book, rushes up to him. Now, there's a problem here, because W.C. Fields did not like children. <laughs> and Bradbury asked, Mr. Fields, could I please have your autograph? Fields rolled, rolled his eyes, sketched his name down, and then said, there you are, you little son of a bitch. And Bradbury's response to me was, Hollywood treated me like that for the rest of my life. <laughs> but from that day forward, he stood outside the gates of all those film studios and collected autographs from Marlena Dietrich, from Rita Hayworth, Jean Harlow, uh, Clark Gable. He went into a dance studio and met a little dancer named uh, Francis Gum, who became Judy Garland. He stood outside Grauman's Chinese Theater and watched Shirley Temple put her hands in cement. He really sat and witnessed the golden era of Hollywood in person. As I said this morning on the radio program here in town, Bradbury, I think, witnessed an unprecedented era in, in humanity, in human advancement. When he was a child in Waukegan, 
he sat and listened to war stories by Civil War veterans, aging Civil War veterans. When he was the Ray Bradbury that we're here discussing tonight, he lunched and dined and became friends with the Apollo astronauts. He knew veterans of Antietam and veterans of the Sea of Tranquility in one lifetime. It's a pretty remarkable thing. And not only did he witness it, but he participated in its advancement by all of his cultural contributions. And so as he was in Hollywood, seeing films in the 30s, he would go to the matinees and see newsreel footage. And as the late 30s and early 40s uh, set in, he saw Hitler's armies burning books in the streets of Berlin. And here was this young man whose life had been altered by reading had this deep and abiding love affair with books and saw that armies would endeavor to throw books into fires and began to wonder why. Why would a military burn books? And as he started to come to the conclusion that books empower us, books allow us to educate and vote people out, and books give us ideas and books uh, bolster us as a society. And that's a threat to those in power. And so you can see the primordial ingredients starting to stir towards the writing of Fahrenheit 451. Bradbury arrived in the 40s as a writer, first in the pages of the Pulp Fiction magazines, Weird Tales, Dime Detective, Amazing Stories, but quickly moved out of that. Time Magazine called him the poet of the pulps because he was a better writer than the venues he was writing for. And quickly he started writing for The New Yorker and Harper's Bazaar and Saturday Evening Post. And at that time, of course, the House on American Activities Committee had started up its inquisition uh, into communists' leanings in Hollywood. And of course, the blacklisted screenwriters and what would lead later to the, the, the Red Scare of the 1950s had begun. Bradbury knew many of the screenwriters whose lives were destroyed. Many of these screenwriters had children and food to feed, and it made him recall his own father who was out of work and couldn't put food on the table. And it angered him that regardless of these writers' political leanings or opinions, in America you have a right to that opinion. And it infuriated him that they would be censored or they'll have their lives and livelihoods destroyed. So again, you can see all these ingredients coming together as he begins to start writing Fahrenheit. In the late 1940s, he wrote a story called The Pedestrian, which he would say is the most important um, final ingredient in what would become Fahrenheit. Bradbury was leaving a restaurant and was walking home in Los Angeles and a police officer stopped him and said, what are you doing? And Bradbury said, putting one foot in front of the other. <laughs> and the officer, of course, didn't like that response um, and continued to... Uh, inquire and ask questions. And Bradbury in his mind started to think, is this man going to arrest me for walking? And he went home and wrote a story about that very concept, writing about a future society where walking is illegal. And as great science fiction writers do, and Bradbury is a great science fiction writer, but he is not just a science fiction writer. <clears throat> he came up with a concept and then had to provide the solution as to why would walking be illegal? And of course, when we walk, we think, and when we think, we philosophize, and we, we engage in critical thinking, and we come up with ideas, because we have time in our minds. And so he came up with a society that was threatened by allowing us to have that time. And he wrote that story called The Pedestrian, it was published, and just a short time later, he decided to take another pedestrian out for a walk, and her name was Clarice McClellan, a young, precocious girl who's taking a walk one night and runs into a man who smells of kerosene, a fireman named Guy Montag. That's the beginning of Fahrenheit 451. You can see the, all the ingredients coalescing. Now, of course, the, the writing of the book is a fantastic making of story uh, that some of you have probably read or heard Bradbury tell in various documentaries. He was living at a small tract home in West Los Angeles. He had two daughters. Uh, they were very young, and Bradbury, as I said, was very boyish and, and filled with childlike wonder, loved to play. His whole life he collected toys. The first time I walked in his home, uh, I was stunned at, at life-size stuffed animals sitting on all the furniture. 
action figures and toy robots and it was everywhere. It drove his wife of 56 years absolutely crazy. Uh, the first time we went to Comic-Con in San Diego, he bought a Quick Draw McGraw lamp. I don't know if you remember that cartoon character. It was a lamp with Quick Draw McGraw and Baba Lou, I think the character is. And he brought it home and gave it to his wife as a present, and she was appalled. Um, <clears throat> so he was filled with this boyish wonder, and he was distracted with his two little daughters and not writing, which was for the first time in his life, Ray Bradbury's not writing. And he told his wife, I need an office. And she said, you know, darling, there's no money for an office. We don't, you're not making enough yet as a writer. He had written the Martian Chronicles and the Illustrated Man and was starting to gain national attention, but the money was not yet coming in as it would soon. And he hopped on his bicycle and rode to the campus of UCLA, to the college library. As a side note, Bradbury rode his bicycle because he never drove a car. A lot of people find that fascinating. He never once drove an automobile, ever. Here's this man who predicted flat panel televisions uh, and sent astronauts on incredible journeys through the deeps of space and never once sat behind uh, a, 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 an automobile and drove it. He was afraid of cars. He saw an accident when he was 14 that so scarred him that he, he said, I'll never drive an automobile. So he rode his bike to UCLA and walked in the library trying to find a nook, as we often do at libraries, a desk somewhere in a corner, back down the deeps of the stacks, somewhere to write his book about a future society where books have been banned and where a young woman dares to keep them and to read them and shares that love and affection for reading with a fireman whose job it is to burn books. And he walked around the library looking for somewhere to write this novel and he heard the sound of typing coming up from a basement staircase, and he went down and found a typing room. And there, on, at rows of desks, were about 12 typewriters, those magnificent old oily Remingtons and Underwoods that have that tactile majesty to them. And he sat down, and those typewriters had timers on them, a dime, a half hour. And students were sitting there feeding the meter, pecking away on essays as I saw today in the Parkside Library uh, on the Max, students writing. Little did they know that this masterpiece was being pe penned next to them. He went to a bank and got a cloth bag of dimes and sat down and started to write Fahrenheit 451. <clears throat> he would take breaks and go up to the library and wander the stacks and touch the books and smell the books and feel the books. He often told me, he said, uh, a new book is wonderful, but an old book is even better. It smells like the pollens of time and imagination. This is a book lover. He loved the weight of a book in his hands. He was not a tremendous fan of e-books and e-readers. He said, you know, you can't smell a Kindle. <laughs> he said, if you do, you might get cancer from the plastic. He would read Shakespeare and Emily Dickinson and Poe and then run back downstairs and write and then run back upstairs and read books on religious history and politics and run back downstairs and feed the meter with dimes and write. And he went day in and day out. There was a terrific story he told me that one day, not riding his bike, he took the bicycle to U or the bus to UCLA. And sitting there, he saw a young man with a stack of science fiction books in his lap. And Ray Bradbury at that point had arrived. The Martian Chronicles had been accepted as this seminal work of science fiction. And he said, young man, do you like science fiction? And he said, oh, I love it. And he said, well, who are your favorite authors? And he said, well, Robert Heinlein. And Bradbury said, okay, anybody else? He said, Isaac Asimov. Okay, anybody else? <laughs> Arthur C. Clarke. He said, what about Ray Bradbury? Oh, yes, I love him. And he said, well, you're looking at him. <laughs> and they started to talk. And he, he said, where are you from? He said, well, I'm from Cuba originally. And he said, what's your last name? And he said, Hemingway. <laughs> it was Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway's son. And Bradbury invited him over that night for Chianti and pizza with his wife and daughters. This is all while he's writing Fahrenheit 451. So he went to that library for nine days. And for just $9.80 in dimes. He wrote this novel. His joke when he was alive and would speak was, I didn't know at the time I was writing a dime novel. Um, 
he would be thrilled that that just got a laugh. Somewhere he's up there <laughs> clapping. Um, and so this book came out, uh, as I said, in October of 1953. At that point, he had already moved on to Ireland to write Moby Dick for John Huston. Um, his agent sold excerpts of the book, could not find a magazine to place it because it was a rather dangerous book to be writing in the midst of the McCarthy era. So no magazine would touch it until they finally approached a young editor who was launching a magazine in Chicago. He had just enough money to publish one issue and he bought the entirety of Fahrenheit 451, the whole book, and decided to publish it in the first issue of Playboy. And that editor's name was Hugh Hefner. And, and I had a marvelous experience. I went to the Playboy Mansion, one of the more surreal experiences. I went to the Playboy Mansion to interview Mr. Hefner. He was wearing his silk pajamas. And I went with Bradbury, and to sit with Hugh Hefner and Ray Bradbury uh, was incredible. Um, but he said, you know, what I was trying to do with, with Playboy was push the boundaries of the time and the era. And a lot of people disagreed with what I was doing, but it was a very scary time of censorship in this country, and I wanted to poke back. And Bradbury's book was a perfect fit for that. Um, around the very same time, if you will, that I went to the Playboy Mansion, Mr. Bradbury called me and said, you'll never guess I've been awarded the Medal of Arts from the President of the United States and they've asked me to come to Washington on Wednesday. Will you go with me? And so I, I went from the grotto at the Playboy Mansion to the <laughs> Oval Office uh, with President George W. Bush and First Lady Laura Bush and uh, Lynn Cheney and Karl Rove, uh, a, 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 an incredible array of rather polarizing figures. <laughs> but regardless of your politics, they were the president pushed Ray Bradbury around the White House himself in his wheelchair. That was a remarkable thing. The first lady came up to Ray Bradbury and quoted a passage verbatim from Dandelion Wine. And he said, how, do you, how did you do that? And she said, because I used to read that book to my students and to the kids in my own library. And that just absolutely warmed his heart. These are the voyages that I've charted in my books on Mr. Bradbury. Of course, if we talk about his other books, The Illustrated Man I mentioned, The Martian Chronicles, Something Wicked This Way Comes, Dandelion Wine, these are just a few. <laughs> Here we see young Ray Bradbury, age three, living in Waukegan, Illinois at 11 South St. James Street, roused from a nap by his beloved Aunt Neva, who had a camera that day, and he said, there's a reason I look a little bit grumpy because I was taking my afternoon nap and my auntie wanted to take a photograph. But he always loved that photograph. That was again taken in uh, the summer of 1924. Um, <clears throat> do we all recognize the man in the fedora? <clears throat> Here we have Ray Bradbury running amok in Hollywood on the right, wearing the trench coat, um, standing with George Burns. Uh, this is in 1934, I believe. Um, and this is a very interesting story, and it shows the gumption and determination of young Ray Bradbury. Burns had his radio program uh, with his wife, Gracie Allen, at the time, coast to coast on CBS radio, and Bradbury would go outside the radio studio. And after they were done recording or, or airing the live broadcast, they would throw the scripts in the dumpster. And Bradbury would climb in the dumpster, an early visionary dumpster diver, and fish the scripts out and take them home and study the format and write his own. And the next day, bring them back and wait for George Burns to come out and say, Mr. Burns, I've written a script for your radio program. And Burns was so gracious and polite, he said, you know, I like your drive, kid. I'll take them home and I'll read them. And the next day, he knew full well that that kid would be standing outside the radio studio waiting. And Burns said, I read it. Keep writing. You show promise, but it's not good. Keep going. Bradbury did that for two years. And in 1936, the first publicly aired, any first publication of, of anything written by Ray Bradbury came coast to coast on the Burns and Allen radio program when George Burns used one of Ray Bradbury's jokes on his radio program. The joke is very corny and it's in my, my Bradbury Chronicles biography, but I, I think it shows you the determination and the motivation and the gumption of this young man a side note, the trench coat that I think is pretty funny, you see there's a string connected to his belt. 
And what this is, is his father had allowed Ray to take his box brownie camera and take it outside the film studios to shoot photographs of celebrities and said, if you lose my camera, I'll kill you. <laughs> so it's tied to a string and it comes out of frame to whoever took the photograph that day and the camera is connected to that string tied to his belt. Many years later, in 1980, Bradbury was giving an award to someone he inspired very much, and that's Steven Spielberg, the film director. And Bradbury was presenting an award to Spielberg and looked out in the audience, and who does he see but George Burns, aging and elderly George, George Burns, and says, Mr. Spielberg, you'll have to forgive me. I'm going to uh, take a moment to recognize someone else in the audience tonight who changed my life forever. And he told the story of meeting Burns and Burns using one of his jokes. And Burns came up to him and said, was that you? That obnoxious little boy became Ray Bradbury. Here we have Ray Bradbury at the very time he's writing Fahrenheit 451. Uh, this is an outtake photograph for uh, the famous publicity shot that's on the back of the novel. I found this in the bottom of Bradbury's filing cabinets in his basement office. It had never been published before, but I think you get a great glimpse of what he looked like at the very time he was writing this incredible masterpiece. <clears throat> Here's Bradbury in the mid-1960s, uh, becoming more of the, uh, the you know, recognizable Bradbury with the glasses and the more uh, iconic figure th that we know. Um, as I said, He's, he's looming over a painting done by the artist who actually did the cover artwork to Fahrenheit 451 with the paper man on fire. Bradbury was a pack rat. I would call him, uh, as he was a precursor to dumpster divers, he was also an early um, visionary uh, hoarder. He saved absolutely everything. I recall one day going through his basement. I mean, it was an absolute junkyard of Bradburyana. And I don't mean to say junkyard in a disparaging way. He just saved everything. And I was going through the desk drawer and I found rubber band ringlets uh, from braces. And I brought them up to him and I said, why are these here? And he said, thank God you found them. <laughs> and he, he took them from me and he held them to his heart. And I said, okay, you have to explain. And he said, those were my daughter Ramona's. You've brought me her childhood back. Thank you. Very sweet. He saved absolutely everything. Another reason his wife went a little bit crazy. There were Everestian piles of papers and, and manuscript notes and, and ideas all over the house. Um, here are the, here's the two of us in 2009. Um, it's rather melancholy for me to see a life pass in, in five slides. But what a life. And what a book you've all read here in this community. Um, he was around almost 90 years old, very proud. You can't quite see, but he's wearing a medal around his neck that was given to him um, for his contribution to the arts in France. They made him a commander of arts and letters. And it was his uh, going joke whenever he gave a talk that he said, I am now a commander, so I command all of you to love me. <laughs> um, I interviewed him this day via satellite to a book festival in Guadalajara, Mexico, and it was a marvelous, a marvelous time. Shortly after that, his health started to decline. Uh, he spent the last two years of his, of his life mostly at home, in bed, um, as his health began to fail. But his spirit stayed up. Um, I remember the very last time I talked to him, I asked him very uh, pointedly, are you afraid to pass away. And he said, no, I'm not afraid at all. I'm afraid to not live. I have much more I want to accomplish. He really w was uh, lived a life of immense gratitude. As I conclude here, this is a great connection to Fahrenheit 451. <clears throat> People often ask, how did, you how did he title the book? When he first published it in a shorter novella form, uh, called, he, it was titled The Fireman. He wrote a 25,000 word draft of Fahrenheit 451 called The Fireman. And he thought that that was kind of a dry, boring title. Um, and when he expanded it into a novel three years later at the library at UCLA, he knew that he wanted to title it at whatever the temperature was that book paper ignites. But he didn't know what that was. 
And so, as he said famously over the years, he called the chemistry department at UCLA and the physics department, and they didn't have the answer. So he finally called the fire station, of all things, and the fire chief said, uh, I have a reference guide that will probably have that. And he came back and said, book paper ignites at Fahrenheit 451 or centigrade 233. Now he told that story many times over the years. After I had written my first book and the manuscript was into my publisher, um, I still went down to his basement office to explore and, and research. And I thought, this poor man, I've gone through everything. I really had upended his house. And that's very much the role of a biographer. It's very invasive. So if any of you aspire to have your lives chronicled by me or anyone else, prepare for your life to be, you know, uh, pilfered. I mean, this poor man, I, I read every one of his tax records. I barreled through the poor man's sock and underwear drawer. And people often say, why did you do that? And I said, where are your autograph books, Ray, that you collected in the 30s? And he said, oh, they're in my underwear drawer. Go ahead and get them. <laughs> and so I, I think I can firmly and, and confidently say that I'm the only person in the world who can answer the Clintonian question as it relates to Ray Bradbury. Is it boxers or briefs? And as he is this incredible contradiction, this great man-child, this man who wrote about technology and the far future but never drove a car and never owned a computer, this contradiction wore both. So it was boxers and briefs. Um, <clears throat> but he had told this story, and I was down in the basement, and I, I, what else haven't I upended in this man's house? And I thought, well, I haven't pulled the drawers of his desk out to see if anything fell behind. And I pulled all the drawers out, and there behind it had fallen some papers. And I reached in, and there was a day planner to 1953, really the golden year of Bradbury. He wrote a book called The Golden Apples of the Sun. Of course, he wrote Fahrenheit 451. He wrote a screen treatment for a film called The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. He wrote um, the screenplay to Moby Dick. It was a wildly prolific year. And there's a day planner from that year. And as I go through it, I find, find this page from January, uh, Thursday, January 22nd. Mignani here, Joseph Mignani, illustrated the cover of Fahrenheit 451. So he's meeting with the artist. Dr. Robertson, Mr. Robertson, I'm assuming, is probably the physics or the chemistry lab. We have physics up top. And now down below, we have the fire department main office phone number and the birth of the title of the book that we're celebrating, Fahrenheit 451. And I found this behind the drawers of his desk. Now Bradbury always took naps all his life. He believed in the recuperative power of the nap. He was a morning writer, and he always maintained that with a nap he had two mornings. So he'd wake up, write, and then take an afternoon 20-minute nap, refresh himself, and then wake up again and write, write again. And I heard him, just as I had found this, lumber, I had the floor joists above me, groaned as he got out. And he, at this point in his life, he had a walker. And he got out of bed, and I could hear the walker sort of going along the floor above me. And I brought this up, and he sat down in his chair, and he held that to his heart. And he started to weep. And he said, you know, I never knew I did this. You found the birth of the title to Fahrenheit 451. Now, as I conclude here and move towards questions, I mean, I hope I've given you a glimpse of this man who I, I'm so passionate about his life. 14 years of my life I've dedicated to him. He became a father to me, a mentor, a dear friend, but also a subject that I've been very loyal to and someone that I'm very committed to writing about with journalistic objectivity despite our, our, our long and deep connection and bond. Um, this journey has been a blessing, obviously, uh, and, a, and an honor. And it's something I'll continue uh, for the rest of my own days. Uh, I teach the only college level class in the world on his life and work at Columbia College in Chicago. It's, I never tire of, of, of this subject. It drives my children absolutely crazy. I say, Dad, all you talk about, the salad you're eating comes back to Ray Bradbury. Can you not do that? <clears throat> but he loved that. He loved that I had this commitment. And as as I, I share this passion and my knowledge of his life with you, and I'll move towards questions, I'd just like to end on the final quote that I think he will be remembered for. 
when Bartlett's familiar quotations finally includes him as they should, now that he is no longer with us. I think the, the quote could possibly be, it was a pleasure to burn, the first line of Fahrenheit 451. What a remarkable beginning to this novel. But it'll also be his life mantra, jump off the cliff and build your wings on the way down. <laughs> Here's a man who dared to write a novel in nine days. Here's a man who dared to write a screenplay to a, a, a doorstop of an American classic. Here's a man who dared to write for television even though he lambasted it in the pages of Fahrenheit 451. Here's a man who dared to design architectural plans without a college degree. Here's a man who said, I'll try it. I'll jump off the cliff and build my wings on the way down. So I hope as you leave tonight, uh, you have a sense of the man, uh, a respect for the way he lived, and a greater appreciation of the book but also you take this life mantra to your own heart and let it influence you in whatever pursuits uh, you are endeavoring to chase after and that you too will jump off the cliff and build your wings. I thank you, this has been a marvelous audience. This well-oiled machine is more finely tuned than the mechanical hound could ever be. <laughs> this staff here, uh, it, you know, I, I told, uh, your chancellor and, and, and Joe, that if, if Parkside's hiring, let me know. I thank you all. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Wow. Oh my gosh. Thank you. And that means the world to me. Thank you.